Will you all join me in prayer? God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today is our final week of our Moses and Miriam sermon series. In modern worship, we are only doing three weeks of the series because, like I told you earlier, next week is our modern worship in the morning. I feel like I have to sing it because it's a song thing. Uh, so we have jam-packed Moses and Miriam into three weeks, and it is impossible for us to believe that we can squeeze all of Exodus into three weeks, as has probably become evident to most of you by now now, especially because we've been jumping back and forth quite a bit throughout the book. So if you have found yourself like very intrigued by Exodus or you're like, huh, Stephanie didn't really talk about the plagues. Isn't that a big deal? You're right. There is a great way to learn more. On September 18th, Chris Dowd will kick off his study that they are going through the whole book of Exodus this semester. So I believe his study starts at 3 p.m. and it begins on September 18th. So that would be a great Sunday afternoon activity if you are interested in Exodus and I left you wanting more. Uh, Chris Dowd, I always call him a professor anyways. He's really great at teaching. Uh, so I encourage you to join him for that study. If you're interested, you can find more information at cumc.com slash connect. So today, like I said, we are going to jump quite a way further in Exodus. We're going to go almost to the very end of the book. And if you've been with us the past few weeks, you know the story so far. If not, don't worry, we're not leaving you behind. Here's a quick recap. Moses was sent down the river as a baby in hopes of saving his life. And as he went down this river in a basket, he was discovered by Pharaoh's daughter. And Moses' sister Miriam was hiding to see what would happen to her baby brother. And as Pharaoh's daughter found Moses, Miriam made this genius move to actually unite Moses and his mom for a little while longer. Then Pharaoh's daughter actually takes Moses in as her own. Moses then goes through some experiences as he grows up where he witnesses the Egyptians, the people who have raised him, abusing his real people, the Hebrews, the one he was born with. And so Moses actually ends up taking the life of an Egyptian. And then, of course, Moses has to flee for his own life because that wasn't a super smart thing to do of him. So Moses settles down in Midian where he's married and has a child. And then God speaks to him through the burning bush, which we talked about week one. And God actually calls Moses to set the Hebrew people free from the Egyptians, Moses and his brother Aaron go on to bring about a number of different plagues from God to the Egyptians. And finally, the Hebrew people are freed. Once they cross the Red Sea to safety, Miriam and the Hebrew ladies give us a beautiful victory song that we talked about last week. And they demonstrate that the Hebrew people are finally given this opportunity to reclaim their heritage and to draw near to their identity as God's people. So the Hebrew people are free, but they haven't made it to that promised land yet because the journey to the promised land is a long one. The Hebrew people wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And along the way, those people, the Hebrew people, understandably get impatient with Moses and ultimately with God. In one instance, Moses is actually up on the mountain speaking to God for 40 days while all of the other people are left at the bottom of the mountain wondering what's happening up there. It's when Moses is up on the mountain that he receives the Ten Commandments. And God tells him of this covenant that God will have with God's people, that if they keep these commandments, God will continue to be their God. But the people at the bottom don't know that this is what's happening at the top. They don't know that Moses is getting this new covenant and these commandments and this new way of living with their creator. Instead... The people at the bottom of the mountain get frustrated. 
they get impatient and they tell Aaron, the second guy in charge, Moses' brother, that they're sick of waiting on Moses and they want a new God, one they can worship right then and there, one that's with them in the moment. So Aaron makes the people a golden calf that they can worship and give sacrifices to. God and Moses don't love this, spoiler alert. So they're at the top of the mountain, and God's like, hey, the people down there are already breaking commandments as we speak. And so Moses comes down to see what's happening. God is pretty much done with the people, it seems, in our scripture reading. It said that God is frustrated, that God finds God's self exhausted with the stubbornness of the people. So as Moses comes down the mountain, he sees for himself that the people are now worshiping this golden calf, this idol, and Moses isn't happy. Moses has the Ten Commandments that he's just been given, and he actually shatters the tablet that the Ten Commandments are on. And a lot of other really terrible things befall the people. Like I said, go to Chris's study. You'll talk way more about it. Then God says this thing. We're going to look at Exodus chapter 33, verse 3. God says this to Moses. Take the people, go to this land full of milk and honey, but I won't go up with you because I would end up destroying you all along the way since you are a stubborn people. God, God, the one who has promised to be with the Hebrew people all along the way, God's saying, you can still go to the promised land, but I'm not going to go with you. The people are disobeying. They're worshiping golden calves. They're stubborn. Moses, you're going to have to take them on your own. The people are in crisis. I'll never forget when I was in seminary, my Old Testament professor, Dr. Heller, teaching us about how throughout the Old Testament, beginning with the release of the Hebrew people, there's a very common thread that can be noticed. Dr. Heller called it, if you do good, you get good. If you do bad, you get bad. Throughout the Old Testament, the Hebrews or the Israelites, as they're later known, they follow God and they do all this good in the world. Then they push God away and they make bad decisions, only to eventually go back to God again and begin this never-ending cycle. This is one of those times in Scripture that we see the people actively pushing away from God. And it's a very real life reaction. How many times in each of our lives do we push away the very people who love and are trying to help us? How many times do each of us self-sabotage ourselves out of fear or anger or impatience? While theologically, we don't really believe that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people, we do understand what it means to push God away. If you're anything like me, there have been moments in my life where I know I should lean on my support system, where I should ask for help when I need it, but instead I try to do it all by myself. I push those that care about me away, and I don't build those relationships that I spent so much time fostering. I also do this with God, too. There are moments where I think I can do it on my own without God's presence in my life or without spending time in prayer or reflection. So when I read this story in Exodus, the story of the Hebrew people just wanting a God that's with them, it's not difficult for me to put myself in the Hebrew people's shoes. They've finally been set free. But instead of creating a bright new life full of second chances for themselves, they're forced to keep wandering in the wilderness. And the guy that's leading them, Moses, he keeps disappearing for these long stretches of time. And then when he does show up, 
he's full of secondhand information or full of all these commandments that they all of a sudden need to follow. Or he's yelling at them for worshiping a golden calf and trying to take things into their own hands. It's easy for us to sit back centuries later and think, gosh, those Hebrew people, they should have just trusted God. They should have just listened to Moses. But I think in reality, most of us can put ourselves in their shoes pretty easily. And then what if we consider how Moses must feel? Moses has every reason to be frustrated with the people, to be over the people like God seems to be. Moses is trying his hardest, but he can't snap his fingers and magic them to the promised land. I don't know that I would have had the stamina that Moses has to keep putting up with the people's complaints and concerns and disobedience. There is a lot of crisis right here in this moment of scripture. They are all broken people, desperate to be in the promised land. Their leader is tired. The people are restless. And God, God seems ready to walk away. Instead of giving up, Moses goes to God and pleads, Exodus 33, verses 12 through 17. Moses said to the Lord, look, you've been telling me, lead these people forward. But God, you haven't told me whom you will send with me. Yet you've assured me, I know you by name and think highly of you. God, if you do think highly of me, Show me your ways so that I may know you and so that you may really approve of me. Remember, too, that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, I'll go myself and I'll help you. Moses replied, if you won't go yourself, don't make us leave here. Because how will anyone know that we have your special approval both I and your people, unless you go with us. Only that distinguishes us, me and your people, from every other people on the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I'll do exactly what you've asked because you have my special approval and I know you by name. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let the church say, thanks be to God. Moses goes to the mountain once more and pleads for God to continue to be with them on this journey to the promised land. Moses pleads on behalf of a broken people, a people who keep making mistakes and pushing God away. I can think of times in my life where someone has spoken up for me when I didn't really deserve it. In middle school, I was super active in sports, but I didn't always give my coaches respect. I would make comments under my breath, or I would question their coaching tactics. I'll never forget, even when I was being a super brat, how one of my coaches continually took time to take me aside and speak words of encouragement and love to me even when I was actively questioning her leadership. What does it mean for us to speak up for others even when they may not seem to deserve it? What does it mean to see someone's flaws, to see their vulnerabilities, and to still fight for them, to still see value in them? It's that kind of radical grace that Jesus teaches us in the New Testament it's the radical grace Moses shows the people here, the people who keep betraying God. It's ultimately the kind of grace God shows each of us, even when we push God away time and time again. The Hebrew people are in crisis. Moses sees the crisis. He too is in crisis. And instead of walking away or giving up, 
Moses keeps fighting for the people. Moses shows God just how committed he is to their well-being and to the future of God's people. Moses speaks up even though he knows the Hebrew people are probably going to turn away again. They're probably just going to make more mistakes. Moses truly believes that only with God can the people survive and thrive into the future. And guess what? God sees what Moses sees. God always has. It's why God has been with the people this entire way. It's why God called Moses. It's why God uses unique, unexpected people like Moses or Miriam and calls them prophets. It's what God sees in each of us, too. We are not too far away from God that there is no hope. We are never too far away from God, period. Even when we push away, even when we mutter under our breath, even when doubt clouds our vision, God continues on this journey with us. God is our voice. God pleads on our behalf in every moment. Moses' story here in Exodus is a story full of twists and turns. Moses takes the life of another human being. Moses helps set plagues upon a nation. And Moses also sets free enslaved people. Moses pleads on a broken people's behalf. Moses has faith that the Hebrew people can survive and can continue to be claimed as God's people even when they give him every reason to think otherwise. Moses in Exodus, he teaches us how we can be called throughout our lives in a number of different ways, especially those moments where we feel unqualified. Miriam in Exodus taught us that we are part of humanity, that our successes only come with the help of God and others, that we are not a siloed people. Their stories, the stories of Moses and Miriam, they show us how faith has endured over the years, and they give us hope that our faith can continue to endure too. Amen.